was given as the new name for the building by our first female president, Corazon Aquino. So this Freedom Hall is the oldest building in Malacanang today. It's now 94 years old. And it was actually built when the Americans were still here in our country. The Americans used this as a working area or as an office. That's why in 1921, they just simply called this as their executive building. So our American governors and officials, they all work here in this building. And this building is on the right side of Malacanian Palace. So if you can see this image in front, that is Malacanian Palace. Imagine our building on the right. So the palace was the home of the American officials, and this was their office. <coughs> but after the Americans, this building was used by our fellow Filipinos during the time of our former presidents. Marcos, during the, uh, his time in 1968, gave a new name for this building. From being the executive building, it became the Hall of the Elite in 1968. Or in Filipino, we call it Maharlika. Maharlika Hall. So during Marcos's time, the second floor was renovated by his first lady, Imelda Marcos, and Imelda transformed the second floor into a large hall for the grand events of Malacanian, or ballrooms in Malacanian. So the Hall of the Elite was the name during the time of Marcos. But again, Corazon Aquino related Freedom Hall in 1986 to commemorate democracy that was restored 30 years ago. So today, this Freedom Hall is the museum and the library of Malacanã. It stands here today and to give everyone an opportunity to visit Malacanã and for us to share with you the history of the place. So welcome again to Malacanã. My name is Louis. I'm your tour guide this morning, and if you have any questions about Malacanã, about the presidents or history, I hope to answer all of your questions in the most informative way I can, and I hope you enjoy this too. So, is this your first time? Yes. yes. Is this everyone's first time? Okay. What other places have you visited before Malacanã in our country? Have you visited Intramuros? Yes. yes. Oh, you visited Intramuros. How about uh, Fort San Chaco in Intramuros? Yes. yes. Have you seen that before? Is that far? Yes. Okay, so at least you have a background in our history. So let's talk about Malacanian Palace this time. Well, many of us Filipinos really want to see Malacanian Palace. For an ordinary Filipino, an ordinary Filipino, it's a dream for you to see Malacanian Palace. The real palace, not just the one on the images, not just the one in our books or magazines. So if you're lucky enough to be invited in Malacanian Palace, it's an opportunity that you cannot just miss. You really have to grab that chance to see what's inside. For other Filipinos, Malacanang is scary. It's a big and scary place. It's very intimidating. It's a palace, they said, that's only reserved for those who are powerful, those who have high positions in our society, those who are rich. The palace is not reserved for ordinary Filipinos, they said. So for them, Malacanang is a place of mystery. And when it comes to the rest of our visitors, it's as if Malacanang's history ended during the time of our President Marcos. So every bit of Malacanian, they believe, is a story related to the Marcoses. That most of the time when we have guests who will enter that museum door, the first question they ask of us is not about the history of Malacanian. Most of the time, the guest will ask us, where are the shoes of Imelda Marcos? So where are the thousands of shoes of Imelda? 
They are here in Malacanang before. They were here in Malacanang before. But this time, they're in another museum. In Marikina Shu Museum, where at least 700 pairs are on display. So she has more than that in Malacanang before. So today is a day that will hopefully change your perceptions or notions of Malacanang. I will be taking you to some of the most historic groups in our country and I hope that you understand later that Malacanang is not just a palace full of beautiful shoots or items. It's not just a palace reserved for the powerful or the high officials in our society or the rich people, but it is also an institution that serves every one of us, every Filipino, regardless of our status, and is always here to remind us of our greatness. Now, let's start with the word Malacanang. Why do we call the palace Malacanang? If that's your question, well, there are so many suggestions on where this word was derived from. The most popular suggestion of historians is that Malacanang is a combination of three Filipino words. May Lakanjan, Filipino words combined together. May Lakanjan became one word, Malacanang. May Lakanjan in English means there are powerful ones there. There are mighty beings right there. There are great ones on that area. Everyone, when Malacanang was not yet here, this town of San Miguel was full of bamboos. And those bamboos were believed to be the home of powerful spirits. In our culture, we call them Encanto, the powerful spirits that lived in the bamboos. So our ancestors who passed by this town, as a sign of respect to those powerful spirits, will always say those three Filipino words. So when the people pass by, they will say, May Lakanjan. May Lakanjan. There are powerful ones there. And they were talking about those powerful spirits. Another suggestion is that Malacanang came from the Filipino word Mamalakayahan. Mamalakayahan means the place of the fishermen. So the place of the fishermen or lugar ng mga mamis in Filipino. Now, if you may not know, Malacanang Palace is facing a river. The Pasig River is how we call it. And during the time of the Spaniards, the river was very healthy, it was very clean. You can catch a lot of fish, especially here in the town of San Miguel. That's why the people call this town as the Mamalakayaka, or the place of the fishermen. So you can definitely catch a lot of fish in the 1700s. So that is another suggestion. Now finally, in the 1700s, Malacanang was constructed. But everyone, when it started out, it was not yet a palace. It was only a summer house of a wealthy Spaniard, a businessman. That businessman was Luis Rocha. However, when Don Luis Rocha got bankrupt, he lost his fortune. In 1802, he was forced to sell his summer house. How much do you think did he sell his summer house for? In Philippine Peso. How much do you think was the value of Malacanang? when Rocha sold it in 1802? One million. Just guess. How much is your guess? 10,000 pesos? Lower. Even lower. 5,000 pesos? Lower. Guess. Everyone? Malacanang was purchased for 1,000 pesos. Yes, 1,000 pesos. Well, uh, it's no longer for sale. <laughs> we can no longer buy it today. I'm sure you can afford Malacanya if that's the value. But that was more than 200 years ago. And in 1802, 1,000 pesos was already a big amount of money. It may be millions today. But during that time, it was already enough for you to buy a summer house, as beautiful as Malacanya was. The one who purchased Malacanya was a Spanish official, Jose Cormento. And Formento used the summer house for 23 years. But in 1825, Mr. Formento died. That's why the property was being sold again. And from 1,000 pesos, Malacanang's value increased to 5,100 pesos in 1825. And in 1825, it was the Spanish government that purchased the summer house. So when the Spanish government purchased the property, it started to change from being a summer house into becoming the palace of our highest officials. When the Spaniards were still ruling in the Philippines, the highest officials were called the Governors General. 
and the first Spanish general to live in Malacanang was Rafael de Exagui in the year 1863. And then the Americans came to our country. The Americans ruled as well in the Philippines. In 1899, the first American governor who lived in Malacanang was General Elwell Otis. But in the year 1935, finally, it will no longer be a Spaniard or an American who will live in Malacanang, but our fellow Filipino. And the first Filipino to occupy Malacanang, if you have seen our 20 peso bill before, so he is featured there. His name is Manuel Quezon. So Manuel Molina Quezon. So today, we have 16 presidents. We just had a new president last June 30. So he is the first president from the southern part of our country in Mindanao. So his name is President Rodrigo Roma Duterte. So after 16 presidents, Malacanian is still here in Manila, still facing that historic river and still reserved for the next presidents of our nation. So there you go, the history of Malacanian. Do you have any questions? <coughs> that you would like to ask before I take you to the road. Yes, sir. During the Japanese occupation, Malacanang still was in good condition and uh, it didn't suffer compared to the other buildings in Manila because the Japanese didn't establish their headquarters in Malacanang. They appointed a Filipino president and his name is Jose Lauren. So the Japanese uh, established their headquarters there in the American Embassy near Manila Hotel. So when the war was going on, Malacanang didn't suffer great damages. There were some damages, but it was not devastating compared to the old city of Manila or Intramuros. Intramuros was really the one damaged during the war. So they didn't establish their headquarters here. They will only come here if they will have a meeting with the president, Lauren. However, Lauren was highly supervised by the Japanese he was fully controlled. All of his issuances and orders were supervised by the Japanese general. It was a difficult time because although he was president, he had very limited powers. It's in Malacanang. So Malacanang always had good faith. Nobody died in Malacanang ever since. Good morning. During Marcos time, yes. how many, let's say, servants or officials I am employed in Malacanang. Uh, we don't have the record of how many employees uh, served during the time of Marcos, but based on the people who worked here before, there were many, maybe at least a hundred for the staff at the Internal House Affairs Office who will be serving the guests during the dinners or the guard events of Inalda. So there were many events during that time of the Marcoses. That's why they needed a lot of employees. But we don't have the specific number of how many they were. For sure, there are many, but we don't know the exact number. <laughs> we were, we come to understand that when Marcos died, he were, he died in the Philippines, right? And he died in Hawaii. Hawaii. Yes. Okay. Hawaii. Then uh, his body was flown back to the Philippines. Yes in their province, in Locos Norte, it's being preserved. It's being preserved. The body of Is it Ferdinand buried Marcos. or it's... Uh, not buried, you can actually see it in their museum. It's in a glass, uh, transparent glass box. And Imelda visits that um, body of Marcos every now and then. So it's still there. You can actually visit that part, but it's very far from Manila, <laughs> in Locos Norte. If you ride a bus, it's around 10 to 13 hours. Oh. His hometown is in Ilocos Norte. It's in the northern part of the Philippines. It's very far away from Manila. But if you ride a plane, it's just only an hour. So Marcos's body is still preserved. So Imelda is a focus. Uh, the museum. Yeah. It's from the family, so it's private, uh, privately owned. So they uh, they call it Malacanang of the North, but it's not really uh, government-owned property. It's owned by the Marcoses. Other questions? Uh, did, did you bring a camera? Was anyone allowed to use a camera? Only one. 
Okay, pa, sir. Okay. Sir, you'll be in charge of taking the photos later of your group. Uh, just remove the flash piece when taking photos of paintings because the heat that the flash produces can affect the quality of the artworks. Okay, thank you. And please do not touch the paintings and the sculptures for their preservation. Again, my name is Louie. I hope you enjoy the tour. You can ask me anything. Okay, so please follow me to the first door. So this was where the guests enter before they can go to the other rooms of the building during the American period. And here in our first room, we are remembering all of our fellow Filipinos who run for presidency. So we are not just remembering the ones who became presidents, but all those candidates from 1935 during our first presidential elections until the next uh, elections in our country. So what you're seeing hung on the walls of the room are the campaign posters of these presidential candidates. So these are not complete. These are the only posters we have acquired. We have the poster of Joseph Estrada. Someone mentioned his name earlier. So he is our 30th president. He was able to defeat the very popular senator, Raul Rocco and Jose de Venecia. So 1998, he received more than 10 million votes. We have a movie star who ran for presidency in 2004. His name is FPJ or Fernando Poe Jr. He lost to for, uh, former President Gloria Arroyo. So we have the poster of President Corazon Aquino. So her son also became president. So mother and son, Corazon Aquino and Noinoy Aquino, are 11 and are 15 president. We have Marcos's poster in 1986. Another one from 1969. That 1969 poster is even made of aluminum. Instead of paper, he wanted it to be very special. We have the posters of our earliest candidates, Emilio Aguinaldo. Our oldest poster from our fourth president, Sergio Osmeña, is now 69 years old. And below the posters, you can see the results of all our elections. Everyone in our history, the highest number of votes garnered by a candidate was 18.3 million votes. Can you guess who got 18.3 million votes? Mm -hmm. Yes. Duterte, Duterte. Duterte. 18.3 million Ay, votes. Our current president, President Duterte, got 16, 16 million. million. So Marcos even got a higher number in his third win. So that was his third victory in 1981. Ah, the first president, Aguinaldo, is there. Ah, 29 years. 29 years. Good first president. But he was not able to live in Malacanang because when Aguinaldo was president, he was an enemy of the American government. Oh. And the American governors were already here in Malacanang. Oh. So he was not welcomed in Malacanang. How long did he reign as Two years only. And during that two years, he was trying to fight with the Americans. He was trying to escape the American forces in Cavite. And then he was captured by the Americans in 1901. So he was brought to Malacanang, but not as president, as a prisoner. <laughs> so the first president didn't enjoy Malacanang because he was a prisoner. So the first president to enjoy Malacanang was Manuel Quezon. So in 1935, it was Quezon versus Aguinaldo. Quezon was the winner. So he was the first one to live here, Manuel Quezon. In our history, the lowest number of votes garnered by a candidate was acquired by this independent one, Mr. Braxton Desploro. Everyone, if you look at that result, that was in 1961, Mr. Ploro got zero. Nobody voted for him. And he did not even vote for himself. So he got zero. It only happened one time in our history. So we didn't think that was possible. But Mr. Ploro did that in 1961. And what's more interesting is he ran again against Marcos in 1965. But in 1965, he got one vote. He voted for himself. Finally, <laughs> 1961, 